Reality change with Chris. Show one. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the first of the new chapter of uh, the reality change with Chris. My name is John Hawkins. Very, very happy to be here and uh, with my friend, uh, Serge Grenbois. Hey, John. Nice to be here and uh, getting ready for this particular part of the adventure. <laughs> That's a fairly generic comment. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, this show is basically about uh, an amazing being uh, who we have called Chris, who speaks as a channel source through Serge. And Serge has been channeling Chris for 30 years now. Um, about 38 now. Yeah. And um, Chris is a remarkable, uh, non-physically focused personality with a great deal to offer, as we shall see in a moment here. Um, <clears throat> what I normally do is uh, just quickly um, bring forward a point or two from our last show, which was in a different uh, arrangement. This is kind of like a new beginning in some ways. Um, and in the last show that uh, we had, Chris talked in a very interesting way about uh, desire. And he talked about uh, freedom of choice in the context of desire. And uh, he told a very interesting story about two twins, uh, a twin, uh, twin brothers who were born in the same family, same parents, same upbringing, same school, same start in life, basically. But one of them, at a certain point, started making choices that were uh, resulting in, basically, uh, him fighting with his life and not thriving, not really being very successful, and not very ha being very happy or having uh, very many uh, meaningful relationships. That's twin number one. Twin number two, on the other hand, remember, same background, same upbringing, practically the same genes, in fact. Twin number two, at a certain point, started making choices around enriching the, his life and expanding his opportunities and uh, circumventing or uh, succeeding in, uh, against obstacles and ending up with a very fulfilling life full of uh, loving friends and uh, the contrast between those two is dramatic. And the, uh, what the point that Chris made that I thought was very interesting is you ask yourself the question, why? What's the difference between these two? What happened? And the answer was very interesting. The difference is in the desires of the particular individuals involved. Because even though they're physically twins, they're completely independent, separate individuals. And they have different desires in their heart. One of them wanted to have that kind of experience, and another one wanted to have that kind of experience. So I thought that was a very interesting discussion. We'll let him continue it. <laughs> well, fine. So I'm just going to kind of get out of the way. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> now we uh, trust that you are comfortable. Yes, Chris. And we thank you for your consideration. And thank you. The subject of discussion concerning desires, desiring, the desiring nature, is a very, very broad and deep topic. Mm. The individual is aware of some of the things that they may wish, 
aware of some things they may desire, some things they may want, some things they may need, all interjected with different overtones of feelings about each thing in particular. Mm -hmm. But again, the key ingredient is the desire. And this knowledge about desires which lead to a particular experience of reality is nothing new. This knowledge has been around, it has been in your cultures and civilizations for a very, very long time in your terms. Mm -hmm. We approached this subject matter when we gave a presentation at the Origo Books, mm -hmm. not that long ago. Mm -hmm. If you would like to read one particular excerpt from one of the Upanishads, the Upanishads were written down approximately four to five thousand years ago. Simply because they were written down does not mark the beginning mm. of that knowledge because these were transmitted mm, through oral traditions for many thousands of years beforehand. Right. So here you have one excerpt from the Upanishads. Would you be so kind as to read it? Well, very good. Uh, you are what your deep driving desire is. As your desire is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. And as your deed is, so is your destiny. Indeed. So this encapsulates how desires begin the mechanisms of reality creation. Hmm. The desire fuels the will, which fuels the deed, which fuels the destiny. Hmm. Four simple little steps. In this you also have a brief summary, if you like, or an indication of what we spoke about before in terms of karma. Ah, uh, sure. And that is where karma stems from. Your desires. Now, some schools of thought proclaim that if you want to experience freedom, then stop desiring. Sorry about that. But as has been pointed out before, you would have to desire to stop desiring. Right, which defeats which the purpose. Which is an oxymoron. Right. The main point is that this knowledge that you create your reality has been with your civilizations and your species from the dawn of your species. So that is a very broad and deep statement. Now, we refer to Uncle Seth. So Jane Roberts and Uncle Seth coined the term, you create your reality. Mm -hmm. And here we wish to be explicit. Some people say, I create reality. That is a very different <laughs> ball of wax altogether. Right. You create your reality and you create reality on two different types of understandings. And one is actually more filled or filled with more holes than a slice of Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. The appropriate expression is you create your reality. Right. Because what you have as reality is the result of experiencing 
the manifestation of your desires as they became will, as they turn into deeds, as they manifest as your destiny. That is your reality. Right. Because for all intents and purposes, you do not create the rising sun and the setting sun and everything in between. But you create your experience in all terms. And since this is sure, is called reality change, then it is appropriate that such an understanding is established. Mm. Because we can assist the individual in changing the experience of their reality, perhaps from one of frustration, one of angst, one of perpetual challenges and crisis management, one after the other, mm. to an experience of reality where fulfillment growth, expansion of awareness and consciousness, and a more pleasing life are the result by pointing out various factors, but overall the basic premise is as described in this excerpt from the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. Very good. And the entire base of Vedic knowledge is also replete with many similar instances of that knowledge being distributed, sometimes through morals, moral teachings, sometimes through other storytellings. But always that experience is provided to let you know that if you are frustrated with the processes of your experience, then that can be changed. You are not specifically tied down forever with the type of experience that you have. Mm. And just knowing this brings about a cascading effect within consciousness. Relief. Relief, knowing that this is not something you are quote unquote fated to continue experiencing. Because there is something that drives your will that can be utilized to change the journey, mm. to change the road that you are traveling upon. And again, even catching a glimpse of the potential here is enough to bring about a different experience of desires, a whole new species of desires. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. Mm. So this can be made available to anyone. It simply needs, the individual needs, the kind of mindset that opens itself up to exploring different possibilities, other than the ones that say, but this is how it has always been. Therefore, I cannot change anything. This has been the tradition. I cannot break tradition. Mm. This has been how I was brought up how my family was brought up, how their family was brought up, and this is how it has always been. So these things can be changed. It is even possible to alter the wavelengths of consciousness so that there are noticeable changes at the level of the DNA. Oh. But in terms of one's personal experience. Yes, right. Not in terms of growing another limb <laughs> or a third eye or a fourth ear. Right. 
It simply requires then that one develop the ears to hear, the eyes to see, and the heart to understand. A simple enough premise. Mm. In your modern society, you are being conditioned more and more to believe that only the gadgets and the gizmos and the entertainment that is provided through the media will bring you relief from the angst of the nine to five and the everyday occurrences that you must suffer through. Right. That is again, but a set of notions that you accept as real. Now, desire, the driving desire, adjusts the will. Right. That will creates various sets of belief structures. Beliefs. Things that you hold as irrefutable truth. Mm -hmm. These things can also be changed, can be altered, so that, again, the resultant experience is more pleasant, more loving, more fulfilling. In this way, again, all things are possible within the realms of experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Chris. The uh, question I have is, well, first of all, I just wanted to comment that um, what you're saying about the, 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 the fact that we can affect our experience of reality and not the mechanics of the, the, how the sun rises makes perfect sense to me. Because the part that is most interesting to me is not when the sun rises or sets, but the psychological processes I'm going through on a daily basis as I uh, experience the challenges and the, and the fulfillment. So the, 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 it's good to know that that's the part that I have the power to change, the part that matters to me. Indeed. <laughs> as an example, you do not create driving but you create your experience of driving your car. Right. And what happens in that vehicle as you drive, whether in the city, in the country, or anywhere else. So it is an important distinction to understand. And an even more important distinction to understand. And we are not the first to bring this up. Uncle Seth has also discussed it. Exactly who creates that reality? Who creates that experience of reality? Who is the who? Who mm -hmm. does all of this? Right. Who, who, who? And we're not talking about owls. <laughs> well, uh, the quick answer is that there's at least two or three different levels of uh, people involved there. There's the focal me, who knows nothing about the fact that I'm going to get in the car and drive to the country. So I have that kind of control. Now, uh, the experiences I have along the way, who I meet, the, the traffic, the uh, encounters, the adventures that I have along the way, from what you've taught us, are also generated by me but not the focal me that is deciding to go to the country, but the much, much deeper me that's working in the dream state with all the other people involved so that uh, the meetings that are needed can uh, happen and the uh, experiences can uh, progress. So, yes. But you also need to entertain the notion that the who, which part of you creates your experience, mm. is 
a little more complex. It is not at all black and white. No. You are, as is everyone else, a gestalt, meaning that you are more than the sum of all of your parts. You are multi-dimensional beings. Mm. There are, therefore, many aspects who have a particular kind of input into the generation of your experience of reality. Just like all of these various aspects of self generate their own dream experiences while you are so nicely resting your head on that pillow at night. Mm -hmm often unawares that so much more activity is generated in the dream state. And you manage to bring some of those particular dream experiences closer to the conscious state, closer to the waking state. But not all of these experiences can actually be brought to the surface of the conscious mind, because they are simply too numerous. You must sort them out. Some kind of a psychological triage mm -hmm. has to occur until such a time as the conscious self is more and more familiar with the whole self. Not whole foods, <laughs> but with the whole self. Okay. Similarly, you are a consciously focused aspect of the self. You are conditioned by your environment and by so many other particular influences in the social, familial environment. You must then also triage so many other kinds of desires in order to navigate this vast ocean of thoughts and inner experiences. Mm. The psychological values have to be sorted through. So you want to go to the beach. But perhaps a part of you also wants to go to the cinema with some friends. And perhaps another part of you is thinking about what to prepare for dinner. What gastronomic delights will you cook up in the kitchen? Mm. You cannot do all of these three things at once. No. Because you also live in a constraint of time. So you sort out what you figure will be the most accommodating, which may be indeed going to the beach, perhaps with friends and so on. Get something to eat there. <laughs> now, all of these various aspects entertain desires. Mm. How will these particular types of desires end up being manifested in your experience of reality? Perhaps one can be done tomorrow and another one the day after. You must sequence these things out according to your perceptions of time and space. So there are many, many different factors involved in the production of the experience of reality you call life. Mm. This is just a basic understanding. Other individuals may experience challenges they find overwhelming. Perhaps they find they do not have the resources necessary to deal with the flow of life as they would enjoy it. Mm. So this sets up particular camps of divisions fragmenting that conscious self, causing tugs of war, if you like. And these are all very, very complex. But let us simply indicate that even in the most complex situations, regarding the nature of the beliefs that you entertain that are gathered to you through the will that comes from desires. Mm. Because you must navigate so many desires and you must make decisions based upon what you want, 
what you will, and how these things will become deeds or actions, behavior, and how all of that ends up as the destiny that you experience. Mm -hmm. What ends up being your everyday experience of life. So this is just breaking it down. Perhaps another analogy is when you go to the cinema and you look at the big screen mm -hmm. at this apparently easy flowing set of circumstances that is supposed to reflect life. Right. But you are not aware of all the multiple texts and all the activities on set that is going on behind the scenes. Everything having to do with the editing, the editing room. Now that digital technology is more prominent, you may not have so much clippings <laughs> of film scenes on the floor. Right. But still, so many things are edited out to create an apparent cogent, easy and free-flowing set of events and circumstances from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie. Right. And if many people try to make a film on their own, unless it is a very short production, would be too bogged down and back away. Because it involves far too many small things which end up creating a big screen event. Right. So all these things go on behind the scenes in the psychological set. Oh, that's nice. Nice analogy. And this can prove very, very helpful because indeed you make all of the events and circumstances that end up being the film of your life, if you like, giving you so much more value when you understand certain basic principles. Well, you know, it's a great thing, isn't it, that uh, we get to focus on the experience and we don't have to fuss with all those under-the-hood details. Indeed. I mean, that's Most good. of you would uh, simply freeze in your tracks, <laughs> not having any idea of how to consciously pursue the matter. Mm. In fact, if most of you, if any of you, as a conscious being, had to consciously focus on breathing, as well as keeping the heart beating, as well as keeping the circulation flowing through the miles of veins and arteries in your body, as well as figuring out which muscles to move, to send the electrical impulses to move the muscles when you take several steps to get a cookie, to go to the bathroom, to go shopping, or even to turn on the television, you would be overwhelmed. So none of these things are actually part of your conscious awareness. They occur behind the scenes in that psychological set. Does that make sense to you? It makes perfect sense, and I'm grateful to the great director in the sky who arranged all of that. Now, if you notice that your results are not to your liking, Mm -hmm. then you can go in the psychological set and make changes. And we will bring some of that information in another time. Oh, good. Suffice it to say that you are never without tools and resources. You use many of them sometimes. And usually based upon conditioning, you continue the old patterns and you play the old programming over and over again, thinking that, for example, if you keep launching Windows 3.5, you will have a Windows 9 experience. <laughs> it is incompatible. Mm. Yes, okay, well, that's fabulous. Uh, a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm wondering if we should take a few minutes break, or maybe we don't need one. A few moments might be good. All right, we'll do that. Thank you. We're back. Now, just before the break, 
uh, we were having a wonderful conversation with Chris, and we're going to get back to that in just a moment. But we wanted to make a couple of uh, uh, coming announcements. The first one is that uh, Chris will be speaking at Origo Books, which is a bookstore here in Toronto at 49 Lower Jarvis. And that's going to be this week, Friday, mm -hmm. at 6 p.m. The title is called is What Dreams May Come. There's another event at Origo Books next month on the 14th of uh, uh, October. That's a Tuesday evening, and uh, I'm assuming the same time, yeah, 6 o'clock. Yeah, 6 to 8. So, uh, and that one is called The Zen of Channeling. And Chris is going to be talking about channeling. Mm -hmm. We'll both be, uh, since I've been doing channeling for close to 40 years now, um, I'll be talking a little bit and also let Chris um, kind of bring his own perspective into it. Uh, and it should be very interesting because most of us think, you know, well, it's very cut and dry, this channeling stuff. You kind of go into a trance and boom. Uh, but I think it's a little more complex than that. And Chris will bring it from his perspective. And that should be very interesting as well. It's going to be audio recorded as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have there, right? No, there's one more. Ah. Oh, um, yes. This coming Monday, September the 19th, is the first of the eight sessions of the online Skype workshop with Chris entitled 10 Principles of Consciousness and the Science of Aspects. There's been a little change in the, in the title there, so uh, uh, I think there's still time to sign up for that, isn't there? Yes. Are we past the early bird? No, I think you can still take advantage of the early bird. Uh, all right. Okay, so those are our coming announcements. Of course, we'll have another show, uh, another Chris, uh, Reality Change show uh, next week. <clears throat> so now, getting back to that amazing conversation that we were having... Um, Chris was talking about how it's possible for us to change our experience of reality using some techniques, and uh, I don't know if anybody noticed, but he, he promised that he might address those in the upcoming shows, the various <laughs> methods for doing that. Indeed, we will be offering insights into how an individual may begin to alter the processes they have internally used, perhaps for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, mm. in order to get a different result. Mm. You cannot expect a different experience of reality if all you hold on to are the same processes that have already generated challenges. And we want to specify in challenges that simply bring out frustration, angst, fear, worry, mm. and so many other similar results. Mm. These can be altered. So these tools we will offer in upcoming discussions. Wonderful. We'll look forward to that. Indeed. In the meantime, I'm going to follow up uh, on uh, something you said earlier uh, in this show, and that was that <clears throat> keeping in mind that uh, you are what your deep driving desire is, and as your desire is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. As your deed is, so is your destiny, from the uh, Upanishads. So my question is, to follow up on what you said about when we begin to understand that we're not trapped in this life, we're not trapped in repeating the same old uh, programming again and again and again, that new species of desire appear. Indeed. It is a very important point to consider. As mentioned moments ago, if you keep using the same processes based upon the same old desires, 
to generate a specific experience of reality. You cannot expect something new to suddenly crop up. Yeah. It is not possible in those terms of the physics applied. However, if you begin to draw through knowledge, you begin to draw a new set of desires, a new paradigm, if you like, mm -hmm. then you cease to be a mm, psychological black hole for the same old types of desires, for the same species of desires. Which produce the same... Uh, results on and on and on. Right. It creates a self-generating loop, mm -hmm. self-generating prophecies. So by altering the premises involved in those particular dynamics, then you begin to have insights into something new happening in your life. And that creates a new flow, as we suggested in an earlier analogy. If the river is dammed up, it is held back by a big wall, a big dam, and everything has dried up, but you want life to begin anew in that riverbed, mm -hmm. then you can begin to chip away and cause small cracks in the dam wall. And as the pressure has built up over so long behind the wall, with perhaps tons and tons of water, so it begins to push and the cracks become fissures and they become more and more noticeable until the water breaks the dam completely. Right. Whether you have a cuckoo clock or not is irrelevant. <laughs> Sorry. So. The water begins to flow anew. It washes all the debris out of the riverbed, begins its naturally intended course. And then life can flow once again in that water, on the banks, in the river, mm. and so on and so forth. At some point during your break, there was also a discussion about video games. Right. So that is important because it can play... Even though the analogy may be somewhat crude, you will get the point. Mm -hmm. And that is that the video game may present to you all sorts of fun adventures. Ways to utilize the characters in the video game. It may bring out some interesting challenges amongst the players. But do keep in mind that None of the characters in the video game can go beyond their programming. It is not possible. So if you have a character that is, say, a werewolf, it will not begin to act in an angelic manner because it is programmed to play the part of the werewolf. Right. And there is only one character. All the various characters have been programmed to act and give a certain type of performance, regardless of how you may dress them up and whatever kind of magical powers and weapons you may acquire and points and so on and so forth, still the programming is established. You cannot go beyond the parameters of the programming unless you actually go into the programming itself and then make the changes at the basic level. So what we are saying in that crude analogy is that we will be offering tips, advice, information and sharing knowledge in how to go into the basic programming or the video game of your life. <laughs> Very nice. Indeed. Mm. Okay, we get to go under the hood. Indeed. Into the engine. Mm. Now, there's an interesting uh, sort of tension there around those ideas, and uh, I'm just going to ask you to clarify. On the one hand, uh, we talked earlier in the show about how it's a good thing 
that the autonomic stuff happens, the breathing and moving and muscles and uh, synapses and whatnot, and that I don't have to consciously think about that. Indeed. Just the notion that you might be able to alter the flow of the synaptic energy is literally impossible at your conscious level. Right. Do continue. So, now, we're now saying that it is possible to get under the hood and to alter things that are normally automatic. Am I misunderstanding? Slightly. Hmm. We are saying that it is possible to go behind the scenes into the programming of life's activities right. and create new paradigms, mm. new changes, so that the results become enjoyable. Mm -hmm. The results become more fulfilling. The results are that you begin to understand how you utilize your basic energies to create your new reality. Mm -hmm. You cannot alter certain functions such as breathing, the blood flow, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the conscious mind can then be cleared of debris, as when the river mm. finally bursts the dam and clears up the old riverbed. As a matter of fact, I had an interesting thought about that, uh, Chris, and you can correct my understanding. But um, when people have, uh, I, I really like the fact that you mentioned that it's knowledge, it's new knowledge that changes the game. Indeed. And that new knowledge um, is, is the seed that uh, results in a, a new species of desires. The uh, the thing that I wanted to... Uh, do you know what? I've completely forgotten what I was going to talk about. We can then continue. Yes, please. <laughs> Earlier, we mm. spoke about ancient knowledge containing this information. Right, it's not new. It is definitely not new. In your Western civilization, that knowledge had been forgotten. Mm. Now, it comes to you in the guise of ancient knowledge. But it is, in an other way, not ancient at all. It is also modern. You could say that it reflects the notion that there are ancient parts or aspects or portions of the self that have been around the block many, many times or if you like, that have been around the solar system many times. That ancient base of self, of the inner self, contains that knowledge. And it is bringing it about in your modern civilization as a means to stimulate you to understand that you are not locked into that old video game, that you can change the parameters and the programming and have a different experience. But you must make the changes. You cannot simply click your heels and say it is done when nothing changes. Mm. It must be experienced. Does that make sense to you? Yes, for sure. So the self is always finding ways to draw your attention. But you must have the eyes to see, the ears to hear the heart to understand. That is also an important component. Mm -hmm. So I already have this knowledge as self. Indeed. It resides in the deepest, if you like, the oldest portions of the self. Mm. And this must come back to another thing we said. Exactly who is doing the reality creating in your life? What part of you is doing that? It is most significant when that knowledge comes to the conscious surface or the surface of the conscious mind. Because then you can direct that 
tremendous power of concentration to affect the changes necessary. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely it does. And um, it's, it's really thrilling in a way to begin to uh, explore the possibilities of what you're talking about. Um, and yet, to be clear, I can make those changes in my experience of reality, not in yours. And, and we say this to the listening audience, the possibilities of change, that potential to change your experience, begins with a small seed, the seed that it can happen. Mm. That means you must think outside of your own psychological box. Mm -hmm. So ponder that little seed of change. But what the other thing that is written tremendously encouraging is the idea that the whole self, who I really am, I'm, I'm every level of self, but at the, at the deep base level, I am continually enticing all aspects to uh, understand and express this knowledge. It goes without saying that ultimately the whole self is involved, but unless you notice it, then you will continue going through life wondering what happened to your video game. <laughs> Yes. Why aren't the characters uh, transforming into something a little more interesting? Indeed. Now, lest the analogy is taken out of context, mm. you have to understand that, of course, you are not at the mercy of the programmer, because you do the programming. Uh, I'm the programmer. Indeed. Oh, okay. But who is the I and the programmer? <laughs> okay, that's good stuff. Um, I think that we are coming towards the end of our show today. Indeed. And I want to thank you very much for um, putting up with some of our production uh, issues. And uh, thank you. Very, uh, thanks for your consideration. Indeed, and we also appreciate our production man. Oh, yeah. And with that, we thank you for your consideration and we turn Joseph to you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, folks, I think that's the uh, end of our show. Thank you very much for watching Reality Change with Chris and we will see you next time.